Because all mine does, when I'm calling method, he says you have to override the setup which uses black and white to the little lift statement and then say return this method. Yes. To I still don't know why it would return anything. Oh, I came across a very fun thing with uh, Jeff I was calling a method, a recursive method, and I had a print statement. And then after that, I had a print statement of what I was going the final return should be there. And that return was like a private variable inside the class that had been recursive. Well, it, it, it just basically the same thing different as and what it was doing was printing out the final value and then in green it was printing out all of the rest. This is in networks and it was getting the wrong value. When I took out the print statements, it was returning the right value. Like it was somehow saving the value of the print statements somehow. I've never come across that before. I have no idea why it's doing that. Works to our understanding, tests 
timings, or is it just a you know, written description of what we think are what, what our programs do? Well, what's the limit in terms of pages? Um, is it one? Uh, I believe it's one page. <laughs> so, don't be that extensive. <laughs> well, be as extensive as you can be within a page, right? So, um, so maybe don't tell me what I already know. Like, I already know what Minimax is and what Alphabet is. You can just say, that's what I used, or what I didn't use. This is why. So this is the specific things to mind. But yeah, what's specific about yours? So the static evaluation function, I guess, is something that's going to be different from person to person. Um, but yes, uh, how did you test it? <laughs> Would be a good thing to report on if you can. It's but do we need to submit proof, as in test classes? Well, I mean, you, you submit your code. You can leave it in there if you want to. I mean, it's <laughs> You're not too embarrassed by it. Well, okay, one of my tests was um, tell me the number of lines that you've got just so I could match it up in my head and what was actually there. Mm -hmm. Like how many fours, how many threes, how many twos, how many yeah, fives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which wasn't really used in the, not directly used in the algorithm. Okay. So I, I can happily go back and make my code one time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's there. You're welcome to submit it. Yeah, I, I guess I'm looking firstly at the big picture. What did you do? What did you try to implement? What methods did you try? And you, know, you tried different things and one worked and the other ones didn't. You can say that. You know, that's the type of thing you report. You can say that I tried doing it using transposition tables. Somebody emailed me about, right? And asked me about, should I use them? It's like, uh, well, <laughs> you could, but how much does it work? I mean, it's, you know, extra work on top of what you're already doing. I think, you know, you might have some other modules you have to do. Um, so, you know, there's all types of things you could try. Yeah, because I kind of saw the point of this was <coughs> the code first. Yeah, the, the main point is to write some code with Linux and Alphabet are working. That would be, you know, the basic achievement if you can do that. Good. You've, underst you've probably understood what we're talking about. Right? After that, you know, you have to optimise it to get it to play well. That's useful too, yes. Why is uh, such a large proportion of marks given for the tournament? Um, because it's a good objective way of sorting out better solutions for less good solutions. Um, otherwise, we would have to spend many, many hours reading code very, very carefully and um, it's, you know, the marking effort would be hugely increased if we, uh, you know, if I did something else. I mean, that's the, one of the considerations that I certainly don't have time to do it and maybe my TA has, has <laughs> time that, um, um, do you have an entry in the tournament? So, do you have an entry in the tournament? I have okay. more than one entry in the tournament. I have such so, uh, a kind of <laughs> embarrassing. Well, no, 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 of course you should. Last year's only big one. Uh, last year's winners in the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, no, well, it didn't. Didn't. The, I mean, the problem is that the best players all draw against each other, um, but actually scored more points. Yeah. 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 No, it's. What the scary thing is that that I had a, I have an entry which does not do any search, which basically uses the static evaluation function, and it'd be half the class or something. So that's, that shouldn't happen. So you should be able to, that's what you, you should try to beat my static evaluation function. Uh, uh, that's, that would be, that's a good goal. There was a question um, that someone puts online today, and I also had one, but um, can you explain what the numerical output from your tournament Program is please. Oh, but it's like big six numbers at the end. Yes, 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 yes. It's, uh, and, and if you don't know, it's a bit wind draw loss. Guess. It's wind draw loss, but but it's then points scored as white, points scored as black, and then there was one point for winning. And then total, and uh, one point for winning. One two for a win, one for a draw, isn't it? Ah, I know it sums up to ten. Yeah, two for a win, one for a draw, zero for a loss. Uh, and then you play, everyone plays against each other. 
twice. Because if I play against you and I, I play first, that's one way around, but also you should have a turn at playing first. And so everyone plays each other twice. And yeah, and that's it. And then so the points as first player, points as second player. Sometimes, I mean, it, it ought to be not all that different. It's not a huge advantage playing first, but it should be a, a small advantage. So can I just check, double check? I've got my number of winning, num number of wins, draws, and losses. I think points, points as white, points as black. Yeah, I can't remember which order white and black are. But points as first player, points as second player, I think, is the order. Um, who starts? White starts or black? I can't remember. White. Okay. So yeah, points as white, points as black, and then total points. It's, I mean, it'd be obvious if that's right, if, it, if there's two things the wrong way around. But if you know what the six columns are, then you should be able to work out what the, which one's which. Um, yeah. So, yes. uh, what will be the Java version that will be used to run the code? So what will be, oh, uh, whatever is installed in the ITL. So if it runs in the ITL. It must run fine. in the ITL, yes, please. Do not use a more modern version than what's in the ITL. Uh, I've had problems in the past where it constructs which didn't, I mean, I mean, the code doesn't compile is the problem, <laughs> right? It's, if you've got the, some, using some new language construct that didn't exist in the previous version of Java, which somebody has done in the past. Uh, so yes, please please compile it in the ITL and make sure that it works. <laughs> yes. So how high in the tournament do you need to get to get high marks or max marks from that? Ah, well, there's, there's a, that's a good thing. Is it? Top half. Am I going to give you a 50% <laughs> average? Uh, no, I, I do. You get some points for for, uh, for beating the random player in the sequence player, that type of thing, for the basic stuff. So otherwise, I, mean, I think it's unfair to, to have an average of 50%. Right. Because more than half the class can pass. Right. So uh, it is, it's, there's a, a non-linear function which I use to convert the number of points you get in the um, um, in the tournament to to how many points, how many marks you actually get for it, um, in order to balance basically the, the fact that at one end you've got the code that didn't compile, which gets zero points. Um, which you don't get zero marks though; you get some marks for other things, but if assuming you've made some progress towards the solution. Um, but, but code that doesn't run correctly, that, I mean, there's, there's all different versions of, of not running correctly, right? There's some where, where a considerable amount of work has gone into it and, and it's a, a good start on the solution, but it's still got bugs in it. Um, and then there's you know, people who had no idea and you know, basically didn't, didn't make any progress on it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, it's hard to say what, what's that mean, how far up you have to be. Well, Uh, you know, I try to be fair in the marking to, to reward an effort of if you've got the basic functionality of the minimum action, I'll, I'll be towards it. Good. It's a good start. Right. But if you're trying to get 90% of the assignment, then you have to play really well. <laughs> but I mean, I will know the good thing that I've got a number of different layers that I've written, and so I know based on how well it's done compared to that. But it doesn't, so if in one year everyone's really good, although if you're all as good as my player, then you know, it's not fair to give you an average of 50%. Whereas if you're all a lot worse than my player, then you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, I've got something to, to benchmark against. Right. Yes. After the deadline, mm -hmm. would it be possible for you to release your player? Just because I'd be interested, honestly. Um, well, since I've used this before, I might use this again. No. Tell me much reforms. It gets written every year. Yeah. Um, no, I, I can talk about. I can talk about some of the ideas. I mean, I don't mind talking about some of them today. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think my solution is. The, you know, the final word on how to do this is just, you know, starting from what I've taught you and then doing some fine tuning to, to get it to run fast. I mean, I think I, I come from a, a generation I'm old enough to, 
to um, to remember when people wrote machine code to to make something fast, you would have to write it. You know, the, the slow part of your code you'd write in machine code. You wouldn't write it in some high level language. And and so you kind of when I write Java, it's like when I write C, I'm thinking in terms of machine code instructions that would <laughs> that would be. I mean, in Java, it's probably not true. Um, but in C, you kind of know what the compiler does to the code. You kind of have some idea of the mapping, and therefore you can optimize and work out ways of doing things that will be a lot quicker than, than other ways of doing things. Um, so you know, I avoid I avoid creating objects, doing things to slow things down. You don't need to just do a lot of very simple computation. But that's that's just to get the extra speed. Thing. I don't know whether that means I can search any deeper than anyone else. I think you actually can't search, search really deep in the um, five or ten, what, ten seconds, did I say? Ten. Yeah. Ten. Yeah. What I think I should do and is do what they do in chess, right? You give you a total time. Rather than saying you've got ten seconds per move, I should say you've got yeah, 300 seconds of, of play for the whole game, and that would be a better thing to do, but I'm not going to change it now. Maybe in the future, I'll do something like this again. Give you a total time, because that would be then a more interesting problem. It's much harder, isn't it? Sorry? It's much harder. Uh, well, I mean, you can just calculate the average and, and do what you're doing now. Um, but, of course, you could. Then it becomes really worthwhile to, to hard code the first few moves and have a dictionary of you know, opening moves, because not waste time thinking about the first few moves, right? Um, because you can save that time for later when you do need to think. But that's, that's uh, something for the future, not, not for the present. So who's got a, a, a program that works so far? Just to give some idea of people do something. Have you submitted it or are you still working? It plays lots and crosses, but it commits suicide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that, that helped. Doing it in the tutorial, kind of getting some practice on a very small scale, because it's you know a very similar problem in a sense. Um, unfortunately, uh, what I've noticed in the past, a lot of people uh, have poor play because their evaluation function has bugs in it, like it's not actually doing what they think it's doing, um, like just checking all the rows and columns and diagonals. Something goes wrong somewhere where they miss out on diagonals in one direction or they <laughs> miss out on one. There's a certain place where you can beat them because it doesn't actually check that row or column or whatever. There's all types of things go wrong. Um, uh, yeah, so be careful of that. Like, double check and make sure you're being thorough in your uh, in the way you evaluate things because uh, a lot of the play, because Minimax and Alpha here will. I mean, Minimax plays well, right? If you just get the, the thing correct, right? To get the evaluation correct, it'll play well. Um, if you're doing strange things, it's probably because of the bug somewhere. Until, until the, the point at which it knows it's going to lose. Because then you're in trouble. Right? If, if your algorithm works out that it's going to lose, this is how when I play against the computer, I know that I'm going to, I've got a, a chance to win. It's because the computer suddenly plays in a random position. Well, not the random, it plays in the, you know, the first open square and they're going for starting from the top left. Because if you can force a win, even if you haven't noticed it, all moves are equally bad, right? It has, it all moves are minus Because it seems you're perfect. Right? It doesn't seem you're perfect. It's assuming you're, you're going to play perfectly. Yeah. So basically, and the thing is, this is a problem with machine players, right? Is that then the machine players then informing you by making such a bad move that that there is a, a way to win. And then you sit there and think about it and you watch and you work it out eventually. You work out what the what the winning move actually is. Um, Sorry? Mine does that when it's a draw. But it works out there's no possible way that you can make a move. Right, yeah, yeah. Move. But the referee also does that, it stops the game when there's a real draw. When there's a draw. <laughs> rather than filling out the board. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's an interesting one, getting around that, getting around Alpha Beta's problem of, or, or Minimax's problem of actually treating all, you know, if, if you have a forcing sequence that can win, 
the opponent has, then for minimax, there's no rational preference, right? Because they're all equally bad. So the person who also win can't do anything. They have to choose a move. But of course, in, in human play, of course it's worth, there's still a better move because you can, you know, bluff. You just keep playing as if, right? As if the other person doesn't have a force move, and you may well be able to block it. Because if they don't play optimally, and so uh, minimax doesn't actually do that. That's what, what in, that's a sense in which it's not optimal. Um, but see so if you can work out how to do that. You don't always want to assume your, your, your opponent's optimal. So if, if you, so the question is, how do you choose between equally ranked moves? Right, normally, you just take the first one. Right, and you only replace it if you find a better one. But there is an argument that says, actually, there is a better move between two equally ranked moves, based on the assumption of the other player not playing optimally. That's one for you to think about if you can find some clever way to do that. You might beat some suboptimal players, or at least survive some games that you would have otherwise lost. So, any other questions on the assignment? What would be useful to you? Yes, okay. I have one that is more clear from which is, <laughs> what depth is everyone going down to? I just want to take it with like, like computer rubbish or Are we allowed to Yeah, yeah. Can anyone get to more than four? Seven. Seven? Wow. Wow. Congratulations. It's not playing up to me yet. Looking <laughs> <So, laughs> randomly. Yeah, Who seven moves ahead and then chooses a random one? <laughs> no. Okay, well, seven's great. Uh, I think four is, is what most people will manage, unless your code, if you can't do four, if you're only on three or two, then you're written in some pretty inefficient code. Um, what does your want? Four, no, oh. no, I can't do any more four. Uh, even, well, well, I don't know, I mean, I, that's the thing, it's like, you, you have to benchmark on something, so again, ITL computers are, I guess, what we're running this thing on. I shall probably remote log into a random ITL machine one night and and uh, run all these, run the tournament. Um, so that, you know, for the timing, I can't run it on my laptop because it might be slower than the ITL machine or faster, you know, wouldn't be fair. So, yeah, so that you have to benchmark it on, on those machines and see how deep you can look. But I think four is typically what people do. Um, yeah. Interesting to see how you do set. Just a 10 second view. The four. <coughs> Makes it four rather than the computers. So my computer's a bit better than ITL, but it's still. <coughs> we'll do most moves, but not difficult moves. Of course, if you think about a game, that halfway through a game, there's a lot less choices yeah. to move, so therefore you should, you could change your depth as you, depending on how many uh, pieces are already on the board. Um, but that requires a bit. Bit of work to work out how fast you think it's because you don't want to time out because then you lose a game. Right? So you want to be a bit conservative, but at the same time, switching to your level deeper will give you a stronger player. So, any other assignment related questions? Just go on to general revision. So something you'd like me to talk about in more detail. Or oh, um, I'm pretty sure this would, was covered in earlier lectures. Uh, Minimax, uh, sorry, Alphabetal works better when you have a shallow, bushy branch because it can trim more, hopefully. Um, I'm not sure if I've misunderstood that from some case. No. No, uh, well, well, I have to think about this. Uh, I mean, alpha beta works 
best when you can when you can sort the moves or when you can kind of evaluate the best move first, right? So if you do an issue of deepening and you can remember remember things, but this is a bit like you know, beyond the scope of the assignment. I mean, maybe something you've done to do that. Right. Go to deepening and remember the scores at one level so that when you go a level deeper you can evaluate them in the order. Nobody's admitting to doing that. Okay. Um, I mean theoretically that should help, right? A lot. Make it faster, but but it's so I'm not sure whether you'd start getting memory issues. But then if you only go to level four levels deep, it's not going to use that much memory. Right. You can work it out, right? 64 times 64, 64 times 64. Well, obviously, less than that, right? 63, 62, 61. And you shouldn't probably, you know, it's a bit less than that again because the first few moves you might just hard code. Um, but anyway, you can work out how many nodes you need to store if you're going to store them. We'll do some revision. See how this works. Let us look. So if I do this, no displays. Um, so, to talk about revising, uh, I thought it might be useful to, some people like the mind map, some people don't, uh, but I put all of the topics into a mind map, uh, so it's a way of organising the material that we've covered. So far we've got, this is topic one, two, three, four, five. 
and we got to decision trees. It didn't complete it. So I remember correctly. We were somewhere in topic six last week. Um, and so I will just kind of touch on each of the things we've covered and give you the opportunity to ask questions about them or to, to think about at least what you've learnt and not yet learnt, what you could learn, um, given. So, in the background, um, lecture we covered what is AI and, and different types of AI. Now, of course, the background was a lot of stuff which was just kind of motivational and, and kind of setting the scene for the, the topic, not a lot of kind of hardcore content which would be difficult to study for exams. But we did talk about, and you know, I'd like you to be able to, to, to say sensible things about you know, what we mean by intelligence, what different ways of thinking about it are, and how would you test for it. I just mean to test. Right. And this, these are open, very open questions, right? There's no correct answer to them. But of course the Turing test is, is an important one in this because it was proposed or it has been kind of thrown around as here's an idea of you know, one way of testing whether a machine is acting intelligently or able to think intelligently or whether it's conscious or not. All these types of issues come into it. Right. So, so what do we mean by intelligence and, and how do we test for it is kind of things that we should be able to at least write a few lines about and, and understand. And then we talked about weak and strong AI. Can somebody tell me what the difference is between those? The two philosophical positions. Nobody, nobody knows? Yes? Strong AI has consciousness, so it acts as in its own self-interest, unlike weak AI, which will most likely be programmed to do something. Okay, so consciousness is probably the big distinction between the two, I think. Uh, strong AI. And I mean, so strictly speaking, you know, it's, it's kind of people <laughs> belong to the I believe in strong AI or I believe in weak AI. It's like, you know, atheists and, and theists or something, you know, the, the people who believe and don't believe. So on the strong AI side, people believe that you can create machines that actually are conscious and think for themselves or whatever. Weak AI is more the kind of we can build machines which do useful things and interesting things which may appear intelligent, but we don't really care with them. But they are intelligent. I want to get into that argument because it's an argument for philosophers and they can argue about that at lunch or at the pub or whatever. But you know, academically we're just here to to engineer and solve problems, right? I think that's probably a good way of characterising the, the different views. Um, and even, you know, I mean, I'm more on the side of weak AI. I, I don't really think of a machine or a program as being conscious. Um, but my boss, <laughs> head of department, <laughs> is a strong AI guy. <laughs> He's a uh, um, Simon Lucas, who uh, does game AI. AI. Um, he, he really believes that we can make conscious machines, just a matter of time. Um, okay, so that's just, there's philosophies and things that people argue about endlessly um, from all fields. Everyone has a, an opinion on it. Um, then we talked uh, a fair bit about the distinctions between thinking and acting. Um, so in the all kind of in the best of all worlds, of course, our machines are embodied and they interact with us in the real world. But of course, a lot of what we're doing in this module uh, algorithms, which are you know, a long way from the real world in some sense, and that only solve games or toy problems or you know, kind of abstractions of the real problems. And that's often quite okay, right? I mean, that's what we do with the calculator, right? When you multiply numbers together, those numbers are abstractions. They might well represent air pressure or volume or mass or velocity or some physical constants, but of course.
course, we extract them just as numbers, and we do all types of calculus and things to uh, to calculate value, valuable to get valuable information out of these these uh, abstractions. So, so that's the distinction between thinking and acting. So. The, obviously, you can't act without thinking, but you can think without acting. Right? So you can have the, the the brain part of the AI, or whether you, you need to have the arms and the legs and actuators and the sensors to to work in the real world. That's a much more difficult problem. Right? So it's much easier to to think about the strategy of playing football than to work out that you know you want to cut this person off and run in the, at this angle or whatever. It's much harder to build a robot that actually physically does that and uh, takes and has, takes all the information into account of what's going on. And then we also talked about the distinction between human and, and rational behaviour. Somebody wants to tell me what we mean by that distinction. For rational, we maximise the function, mm -hmm. which is uh, usually just low value, so you can you know what what to maximise human. Balance, can be emotional, can be physical, can be depending on are you afraid of aggression. Yep. Yeah, okay. So there's lots of human factors you can talk about. I mean, humans, uh, although we, we like to think of ourselves as being rational, um, we are demonstrably irrational in, in many areas. Right? And, and therefore, copying human behavior is not always the goal of artificial intelligence. Right, it's often, although sometimes it is the goal, right, there are some situations where you actually want uh, human performance because maybe you're trying to model something about perception or production or whatever in, in uh, human psychology. But of course, for uh, engineering type problem solving, you generally want rational behaviour. You want something, yes, you want to maximise or optimise some utility function. Now, you said something about humans can balance different things. Well, yes, but the utility function can also balance different factors, right? As long as you've got them into your utility function, yeah. right? So you can still optimise conflicting goals and, and come up with the best solution according to the way you define the problem. Okay, so it's a lot of the things. Sometimes people um, trivialise what you can do with rational behaviour. Right? You can make a very complex. Um, reasoning process uh, in under under rational behaviour by defining, but then you have you know the, the difficulty is getting that utility function right because you know when you've got complicated things to consider and to, to combine conflicting views, which you know people often have to do to, to solve problems, um, it's hard to reduce those things to numbers and to know how much weight to give to each one. But then again, you know, when we're reasoning about real-world situations and we're looking at conflicting things, it's hard to know also, you know, how to balance the different views and, and which ones to, to put more weight to. So I think those were the main topics we looked at in the, the background um, section. There's not a lot to kind of memorise for exams, but, um, you know, it's basic stuff you should at least be able to explain and... and um, Know, have an understanding of, um, since we're doing AI, you should know what it is. Right, the second topic we looked at was agents, and um, we looked first at what an agent is, um, want to take a shot at what an agent is? Sensors and actuators. Well, it has sensors and actuators. <laughs> yeah. And also it has some, in some way to something. Sorry? It responds in some way to things. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it exists in some environment. And if you want to kind of continue that model of actuators and sensors, there's a, it has some performance measure, right? That it's trying to optimize. Um, yeah, so what's an agent? We had that architecture of an agent thing where we have the, you know, it has the, the sensors taking in information from the world, it has the actuators responding, and it has some 
agent program to the brain in the middle that's deciding what to do and trying to, um, you know, try to optimize its utility or achieve its goals, whatever, however it's being programmed, depending on what type of agent it is. Um, and a rational agent then, Somewhere in the lecture slide, there's a definition of this. It says a rational agent is an agent that always does the correct thing based on its perceptions. Yeah, that's right. Based on its inputs, and based on its inputs and background knowledge, right? It does the what's the provably correct thing, right? Um, so it's optimizing its utility function, or it's trying to achieve its goals. I think is the way it's first defined, and then later, because later I introduced the utility function, I think. So at first we're talking about just goals, and then we say, well, the goal's a bit too coarse, because sometimes you have more than one way of achieving the same goal, and one way may be better than another. Um, other times you may get some distance towards the goal. Right? Your goal may be to get 100% of the assignment, but of course you just want to get as far as you can towards that goal as, as possible, right? without ever Reaching it, perhaps. Um, okay, so that's how we define a rational agent. Um, and then the P's model stands for P for performance measure, E for environment. environment. We've already had the actuators and sensors. Right there, the four aspects that we use to define kind of the agent of its environment. Um, we had the idea of the architecture and program, which I've already mentioned. Um, and various types of agent. What types of agent did we have? And we had a reflex agent. We had reflex agents. We had goal-based agents, utility-based agents. Right. Yeah. Agents with state, that's the other distinction. Whether or not this so a reflex agent reacts based on its input. So basically it can look and see the world and decide what to do based on that. The agent with state also has some memory of the past, um, which is a particularly useful thing to have, of course, because um, you don't always want to respond in the same way to the same input. Right? Given the same input, you might want to do something different based on what's happened in the past, especially if you're in a situation you've been in before. Right, and probably doing the same thing is not a, um, well, in some cases it would be the right thing to do, but in other cases it's the wrong thing to do. Um, and then goal-based utility-based agents, so these are more general purpose. You can give them a goal or a problem to solve and it will solve that problem. Or if you give them a, a utility function, they will maximise that utility function. So these involve some type of planning or search uh, to work out what action should I perform in order to, because uh, usually you can't achieve your goals in one step, you have to plan a sequence of actions that will take you towards those goals, or, and the same with utility functions, that you want to, you know, perhaps your first step that you can take will not maximise the utility function, but you can plan a sequence of actions that will give you the highest utility at the end. Okay, so those are different types of agents, and then we talked about different types of environments. <coughs> and lots of stuff here. Uh, lots of ways of describing environments. What's an environment? Do you think an agent acts upon or inside? Yeah, anything of agent acts upon or inside? Yeah, that's good. Anyone else want to put it in different words? Domain. Sorry? Domain is a good word. The domain in which an agent operates. So yes, it is exactly you know, the uh, domain in which the agent uh, acts and senses. The world in which the agent lives and that can be the real world, of course. We have an embodied agent acting in 
real world, and they may actually only be acting in a subset of the real world, like down, a, down the mine shaft or in your in a house, sort of a domestic robot that does vacuum cleaning or something. You know, right? It may well have some tightly defined bounds in which it works, um, or of course, much more tightly defined that it's a its environment is a chessboard or something. It's just playing a game of chess, and therefore there are 64 squares and there's 32 pieces maximum, and so on. Um, so there are various <coughs> um, different types of environments, and, and we have ways of describing the environment that help us to understand how difficult the problem is that we're trying to solve. Right. So for each of these, there's an easy and a in the difficult case, right, whether it's fully or partly observable environment, what does that mean? The only thing that's going on to the sort of agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it's fully observable, you can your sensors tell you what you need to know. You can see everything, there's nothing that's obscured or hidden, right? But all the information which is relevant to the task you're supposed to be solving, which is either achieving your goals or optimizing your utility function, right, then all that information is, is available to you uh, by observation, so through your senses. Uh, deterministic versus stochastic. What's this referring to? Random versus repeatable. Yeah, random or repeatable, but what is what exactly is random or repeatable? Events in your environment. The events, yeah. So the effects of what you do. The effects of what you do is, is important here. That basically, that, um, well, of course, we get down to the single and multiple agent and there's other things going on here. But let's just take it. We have a, a simple world in which it's all static and nothing's, nothing's happening. Right? No other agents. There's nothing disturbing you. Then the only thing that changes are the things that you change. Right? So let's say you're playing solitaire or something. Right? So nothing changes unless you make an action. And then if the effects of your action are predictable, right, that's deterministic, right, that's, you can reason then that by performing this action I know exactly what state I'm going to be in. And you can reason then to a goal. Whereas if you're in a stochastic situation where you're rolling dice or uh, spinning a roulette wheel or something where you don't know what the outcome's going to be, then you have to reason probabilistically, and you can't so easily plan a sequence of actions. Um, you can still plan the most likely sequence of actions, but you often have to replan after each step. Whereas in a, a deterministic world, you may not need to replan. You can actually come up with a, a sequence of actions that takes you to your goal and just do them. Close your eyes and perform the steps, right? You don't need to observe anything more. Um, OK, so that's. Uh, another distinction we have. The third one is episodic or sequential. This one's slightly less intuitive. Was it something to do with the same things happens over and over again? Like sun rises every day would be episodic? No, no it's not. It's more to do with how, you, how time is segmented. Right, the episode is, is, I mean, basically, are you reasoning about a sequence of actions, or can you reason about a, a kind of a, a block of time, an episode, and not worry about how that relates to the past or the future? So you have an arrow of time. Yes, Sorry? If arrow of time is sequential, you can shuffle it, and it's a design. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's independent of order. I mean, the thing is, you can have... I guess where it gets confusing is that the episode may have a sequence inside it. Right? <laughs> so, so you have to kind of think, think in, in terms of these are different layers. Right? But, if, but if you have separate episodes, then basically they have no effect. So yes, I guess you can change the order of them. It doesn't change what you should do, whereas sequential, you know, and, and so uh, that's, I, I don't find this a very useful distinction, but most of the other distinctions are, are particularly useful, 
Um, but I, I guess there are cases where, where time is irrelevant and you just need to find all the treasures on the map or something. It doesn't, you know, into them in any order, you get the same result. I don't know. Right, that's something where perhaps you can plan for the separate episodes where you solve this problem, then you solve that one, then you solve that one. Right, it doesn't matter what order they are. Right, whereas if, you know, in a typical situation where you're interacting with other objects, and of course the order in which you do things becomes very important. Static and dynamic. This is easier and much more intuitive, I think. The environment doesn't change unless the agent takes an action. Yeah, okay, so a static world, the environment doesn't change unless, unless you take an action, so that's a way of saying things aren't changing while you're thinking, which is nice, right? You have time to think. Uh, and then form your action. Um, dynamic worlds are particularly difficult, but even when you've thought about something and decided to do something, by the time you've decided, maybe the world's changed and it's not, no longer the best thing to do. And so when do you stop thinking? Uh, you, never, you know, unless you can very quickly perceive and act. If you think, decide on a move, you check, is it still the right thing to do? And if it is, you quickly do it. Uh, check that nothing's changed. Um, okay, so state versus dynamic. Uh, discrete and continuous. But they're standard meanings. So the things you're measured with, uh, like integers or real numbers, is real numbers is continuous, integers is discrete. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, of course, not, we're not always dealing with integers. We might be dealing with a chessboard, right, where we don't really care whether the rook is two millimeters off center, as long as it's on the, on the square you think it's on. Right? And there's only 64 possible positions where that rook can be on the, on the board. Right? So, so that's a, a typical example of a discrete environment. And of course, any real world environment is, is continuous. Um, and finally, single and multiple agent is obvious. Right? Are you the only agent, the only thing that changes the environment? Or are there other agents also involved? And if so, then we make distinctions about whether they are cooperating with you, right? in which case you have some very interesting planning tasks. Right? That how do you get agents to cooperate and, and to achieve a goal, perhaps by not all of them trying to do the same things, but by taking on different roles. Right? Just as if we, you know, if we had to build a bridge as a class, right? as our task to build a bridge, we'd all take on different roles, right? and work out how to, you, know, you need some planning to how to do that. And of course the other type is the um, competitive uh, multiple agent environments where it's also interesting because then you have to work out how to cater for an agent that's acting against you. And so we're looking at Minimax and, and doing that in the assignment so you'll have a, a good understanding of a competitive multiple, multiple agent environment. So any questions on, on topic two? Is that all? I think those concepts are all you know, easy enough to, to understand, but they're good to look, think back to when you're actually doing real problems and thinking about these distinctions um, and understanding you know, what makes a problem difficult or, or not so difficult. Um, so after topic two, we then went into three topics on search. We looked at basic kind of finding sequences of actions in the first kind of first topic on search. And then local search is more about finding uh, or optimizing a single state, or it can be a set, a set of states, but optimizing and where you don't actually care about how you get to the solution, you're just trying to get a solution. Whereas the first search is, is more about finding that sequence that takes you to the um, to the goal. And then, of course, adversarial search is what we're doing with the assignment, where we're um, searching a, a game tree and finding the optimal strategy to play against another player. So, for search, we looked at the
definition of what, well, how, how we're going to approach problem solving in this module. So given a problem, what do you do? How do you express it? We talked about the importance of the representation. The way we represent the information is absolutely crucial to get uh, good solutions. Right? So the data structures you choose for your searching for three in a row in your assignment, right? that makes a big difference. Right? If you choose good data structures, you can make the problem so much easier than if you choose bad data structures. Right? You can abstract away from the board and come up with much better data structures that describe what you should be searching. Right? Um, so that's problem formulation. So what did we look at? We looked at defining uh, this state space type representation of a problem where you have a, a general state, right? the, the way of describing the world, the variables of interest. Right? Many different ways of doing that, but as I said, that makes a big difference. If you get this right, the problem becomes much easier. And then to for the specific problem that you're trying to solve, you have an initial state, so you have some particular values for those variables, your starting point, and then you have the set of actions you can perform, and those are defined in terms of the effect they have on the state. So they map one state to another state, so there's a state transition. Um, and then the, the goals. Like what is the problem we're actually trying to solve? How are you going to measure? So that's kind of your performance measure, if you like, your agent formulation. Okay, so that's problem formulation. We did some examples of that in the tutorial. Um, so you have some idea of you know, some simple kind of puzzle type problems where how you go about and formulate them. Of course, this is kind of. Um, A planning step that you do, like in software engineering, right? If you have to write code to, to solve the problem, right? Then you have to come up with the data structures, right? Your state representation, right? And then the methods, the things that act on the, take you from one state to another state, right? So, so initialization also. Right? I mean, this stuff when you're coding, you're doing these things too, but we're doing this at a more abstract level, so we can solve problems on with pen and paper. Um, but of course, if you're coding it, then you, you will have to think about these things, and I advise you to, to think these things through first, right, to work out these aspects before you start typing in Java code. OK, so that was problem formulation. And then, of course, once you formulate the problem, how do you choose the sequence of actions that take you from the initial state to the goal? Right, that's the, the big question. Right, that's what we spent a lot of time on. Um, and we particularly looked at travelling around Romania. That was the example in the textbook. And it's actually a very nice example of, because it allows you to explore different search algorithms and look at their properties and how well they work and how you adapt them to, to make them optimal for particular situations, or particular uh, types of problems. And so we talked about the concept of the state space. So this is kind of the, the state space search approach. The state space is what? We ask you to, to, to define a state space. What is it? It's a set of all possible solutions. Almost. It's a set of all possible action. states. States, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you just keep trying, you'll get there eventually. It's a set of all possible states you can get to. So given starting from the initial state, you apply all legal actions in that initial state, and you get another bigger set of states. And then in all of those states, you apply all of the possible legal moves or actions in those states, and so on. You do that forever, uh, and you've got the state space. Right, it's the space of all states you can get to from the given initial state. Okay, it may not be 
all of the states that you could possibly represent given your, the data structure that you've defined. Because some of them may be states that you can never get to, right? So some subset of that. But generally, it will be most of, you know, it may, you know, I think typically it is all the states. Um, but I guess let's, no, let's take an example like chess, right? There are many chess positions if you just randomly ask a two-year-old child to place pieces on the board, then many of the configurations they will do will not be legal chess positions. They will be positions of the pieces that could never occur in a game. It would just, there would be no sequence of legal moves that would take you to that state. So, so the, the state space is, you know, strictly it's just, it's just a set of, of legal of states that you can get to, given your, your uh, actions and, and legal states. So then, uh, <coughs> what we looked at was generating sequences of actions that so take us to a goal, and the way we do that is with uh, a gender-based search. Right? We have this general algorithm, which covers all of the algorithms we looked at in this topic, right? where we have an agenda of basically these are the things which we are considering. It starts off just containing the initial state, and then as we expand states, the expanded states are in the agenda until we expand it then, right? and we do so in some order. Right? And so the idea of expanding nodes and adding the, the children, right? or the, the resulting states and their uh, information, to our agenda. Right? So I would like you to be able to do that, given any algorithm, breadth first search, depth first search, Issue of deepening, A star, uh, what were the other ones we did? Uh, uniform cross search, and so on. Right? You should be able to do those, apply those step by step, and show the agenda and show them how you get from step to step to get to a solution. Showing that you really understand how the algorithm works. Right? If you understand the algorithm, right, then it's quite mechanical to apply these steps. Uh, and of course, they they work differently depending on the choices you make of exactly what type of search you're doing, but they all fit under the same umbrella. Right? And the main difference, of course, what's, what's the main difference between all of those search methods? I just listed about five of them. What's the main difference between them? If they're all using the same agenda based search algorithm, what's different about them? Order of the agenda. The order, yeah, exactly. The order of the agenda, basically. What order did you expand the notes? Right? So the, the agenda, in some sense, sorts or fails to sort. Well, I mean, it's always sorting them. But it may sort them first in first out order or first in last out. Uh, or last in first out, let's say, don't know. Um, or it may be a priority queue that has sorts them by some order of utility. The ones with a higher utility or a lower cost will be expanded before the ones with higher cost and so on. Um, and then those costs, of course, can be based on cost so far or predicted cost remaining. Right? So those are the different ways of um, doing agenda-based search. Uh, the execution is right, quite straightforward. Right? Given an agenda, take the first thing off the agenda, expand it, and the children, well, actually, you, you, you take it off the agenda, you check whether it's the goal. If it's not the goal, then you put the children, expand it, put the children in the agenda, and we let, that's the loop, it goes forever. But until you either, what can happen? When do you stop? Either when you get a goal, right? What else can happen? It fails to find your goal. Okay, well, how do you fail? Searchable space. Yeah, but I mean, two things. In terms of agenda-based search, what happens to your agenda? There's two things that can happen. Empty. It can be empty, in which case, there's nothing more to say. So you, you take the last thing off the agenda, it doesn't have any children. It's not the goal. Right? Then you have searched the entire search space, and the goal was not in the search space, unfortunately. 
So that's one way of failing. The other way of failing is, of course, that the agenda is never empty. <laughs> you just go around in circles, or maybe not circles, because you may have continuous variables. Right? But you just keep searching and searching and searching and searching. And the agenda may be getting longer and longer, perhaps. <laughs> uh, it may not be. Um, but you may just fail to reach the solution in any kind of given amount of time. Okay, oh, a bit too far there. So that was problem solving. The next topic in uh, search was the uninformed search. And we've talked, well, I've mentioned these different approaches, but maybe we should just describe them quickly, which, well, in terms of the agenda based search, what does depth first search do? Puts the children node at the front. Okay, puts the children node at the front of the agenda. So that corresponds to what data structure? A stack. Oh. Right. The last thing that was added is the first thing that comes out. Right. So the most recent things. So you just. Basically, the most recent things you generate keep getting searched. Um, bread first, then. It's a queue. Put the expanded nodes on the back. Yeah, the expanded ones go to the end of the queue, or the back of the agenda, the end of the agenda, whichever way you want to describe it. It's a bread first search. Uniform cost. Put the one with the lowest cost. Yeah, you put one of the lowest costs at the front, or strictly speaking, as you add new nodes, you put them in sorted order. Right? You insert them in the place they go between the, the one that's got a lower cost and the one that's got a higher cost. Um, so, so, you, so you maintain a sorted list, however you do it, or you know, tree or whatever structure you actually use in real life. Um, but some way you're maintaining some sort of data structure so that the, the first thing that comes off the agenda is always the thing with the lowest cost or highest utility and what it is that you're measuring. Okay, and then iterative deepening. How does that fit into this picture? It is the first search, but you cut it off one level at a time. Yeah. Restart it from the beginning. Okay, so it's, it's a depth first search. It's important to Remember that this is a special type of depth of a search where you have a fixed maximum depth, and basically you start at one, and if that fails to find a solution, you go to two, and then you go to three, and you go to four. Right, but of course, you don't have to do it exactly like that. You could just take even numbers, or you could just start at five, or whatever you want. Right, there's many ways you could apply it, but the concept, the basic, most basic way of doing it, is just starting it. Um, Starting at one and just incrementing by one each time. You don't you need to save one, two, and three every time you're going down. You can't just start it from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. I mean, that's the, that's the basic iterative thinking does that. It's just that there are times where remembering what happened last time could be useful, such as for alpha beta pruning. Right? That's where you, if you knew which of the ones at the previous level were had the highest score. Um, then you expand those ones first and therefore get a better print. Better print. So that's the, um, the concept there. But yeah, it's, as a basic idea, it's um, you're doing repeated depth first searches, starting at a very small maximum depth and increasing the maximum depth uh, one at a time. Why would you ever want to do that? Same Sorry? It's, it's, it's more economic with memory. Yep. And it is optimal in some way, I think. Sorry? It is optimal in some way. It's optimal in some way, too. Can we have a huge step? Yeah, it changes a huge step. Well, I mean, yeah, so if, if, this, if it's infinite depth tree, let's say, this allows you to do a depth first search. No? I 
So again, the, but the reason we use depth first search rather than depth first is that depth first needs lots of memory. Depth first needs very little memory. Um, and depth first can get stuck in infinite loops if you have an infinite depth tree to get around that problem. Um, and the other thing to say is that it gives you the, I mean, depth first search has the guarantee, right? Which one's, right? Depth first is not guaranteed to give you a solution, depth first search does. Guarantees to find the shallowest solution, um, which is good, but sometimes needs more memory than you've got. So you can do it, the same thing with iterative deepening, you can get the guarantee of finding a solution at the, when we get to our maximum depth being the depth of the shallowest solution, then we'll find it. And we'll do it without using all the memory that breadth first search needs. So in practice, it turns out to be um, important for that reason or useful for that reason. But it's also, in practice, important to, to make the point that all the extra computation you do by repeating the search of the same tree and then just adding one extra level to it, if the branching factor is like it is for your uh, assignment, a large number, like starts at 64, um, then the percentage of extra computation uh, from one level to the next, right, it's only 1 over 64, is extra, or I mean it's a bit more than that, but, but effectively then each level down the tree is so many times more nodes than the rest, that it doesn't matter, right, that it becomes kind of trivial, right, that you don't, it's not adding, I mean typically it adds a, um, you know, a, a few percent extra overhead in terms of the extra computation you're doing, and it turns, at the same time it's turning an unsolvable problem into a solvable one, because you know, didn't have enough memory to do it anyway with prep first. And that's sort of the basic thing. That's the basic thing. Now, of course, as soon as you start storing that, uh, if you then say, I'm going to do it here deepening and remember every node I've visited so that I can use that in my alpha beta pruning, uh, then you've got an issue with how much memory does this use. Right. Um, but it's... Uh, it is still, well, potentially feasible. If you're only searching four levels deep, 64 to the power of four, right? I mean, these are not such large numbers that you're running out of memory. So I think it would be physically possible to do. Uh, it may allow you to go to a, a level deeper where you, <laughs> you do run out of memory. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, I think, possible. Um, okay, so those are all uninformed search methods. And what do we mean by uninformed? Non -heuristic. Non -heuristic. Sorry? Non heuristic. No heuristic, exactly. So uninformed does not mean stupid or uneducated. Um, and it, doesn't, it doesn't even mean that we use no data, right? Because although you could call depth first search and breadth first search blind search algorithms, because they're not using any measure of cost at all, they just check whether you reach the goal. Um, uniform cost is using a measure of, of cost so far. Right? So it's not, it is using some information about the problem. But it's not using any heuristic information. Right? So there's no guesswork involved. We're not using anything that's not explicitly specified in the problem. I think that's the distinction we make. Right? It's a bit of a tenuous uh, distinction, but it's nevertheless important one, and it's, it's clear that what we mean by uninformed here is we use any information that we know so far in the heuristic search, we're trying to guess information that we don't have, right? That we might be using some information that we can kind of, we can infer based on the, the, the um, things like the straight line distance between points, the type of thing we do, that we infer that, okay, our actual cost is going to be at least this much. Right? So we have some way of estimating a lower bound, for example. Um, but of course, that's not the same as in uniform cost search, where you've got actual costs being considered. So on the heuristic side, we looked at three algorithms. Uh, the greedy search, where you just take the 
node which is closest to the solution. We can expand that. Um, right. Not optimal. Can't guarantee to get to a solution this way. Um, but for some problems, it works reasonably well. Uh, and we looked at some variants where, um, well, actually, in the next topic, more in the local search, we looked at, because that can be seen, that can be used as an optimization method, as well as a path search method. Um, and then we looked at, well, okay, this is a good idea in some sense to consider the cost remaining, what's it going to cost to get from where I am now to the goal, and deciding based on that which of the points in my agenda are desirable because they're close to the goal. Um, but of course, the cost so far is also important because we want to minimize the total cost of getting from the initial state to the goal. And therefore, the idea is to combine the two. And of course, we just add the two numbers together. Uh, we have a cost so far and an estimated cost remaining. Add them together, you've got the algorithm A. What's the difference between A and A star? It's a very small difference. Your estimated cost is something admissible or something. Your estimated cost has always got to be less than the actual cost. Yeah, less than or equal to. Right. So the, the estimated cost is, in the case of A star, it's a lower bound right, of the real estimated. So the real cost that you're getting from the current state to the goal, right, the, the estimate or heuristic function will return a lower bound. And that means that A star is just a subset of A, right? It's the A you can use an inadmissible heuristic, one that just takes a random guess, which could be sometimes too high and sometimes too low. In A star, you can only choose uh, heuristics which are less than the actual cost, unless they're equal to the actual cost. But of course, the nearer they are to the actual cost, the better they will work. And we talked about that. And um, that's, these are very nice algorithms. So if you have a problem that can be solved with this algorithm, it works really, really well. Right? It's guaranteed to be up more in many different ways. But of course, the important thing here is the, the difficult part. Of course, you, know, you find these beautiful algorithms that can solve problems brilliantly, and so elegantly, and then they say, well, but there's no real way of knowing how to work out the heuristic, right? You have to just come up with a clever idea. Right? So that's the other side. There's still some human effort involved right, in solving a problem in A star, but often there is some information. We talked about that with the root finding type problems where you can use the straight line distance as a, a, a lower bound, but then we also gave it example with the eight puzzle where you can think about other types of heuristics that also exist in, in other situations where the number of moves you may need to make can be estimated or at least a, a lower bound on them. Okay, so any questions on search? Yes? Yes. Yes, it won't. It could return a suboptimal solution as if it were optimal. So it, there may be something further down your agenda that will give you a better, better solution, and you'll find. Because once you find a solution which is at the front of your queue, right, or, or the, you know, when it comes off the queue, that's your solution. That's when you stop. So you'll stop too soon. Um, you'll find a solution that's suboptimal. Uh, if your heuristic comes to zero every time, then you will be doing what? Uniform cost search. Uniform cost search, right? Because that's exactly what uniform cost is. It's the cost so far plus zero. Right? So, so yeah, your worst case is you're doing uniform cost search, which is optimal, right? It will find the best solution, but it will expand a lot more nodes than it needs to. Right? So, so you want to push this to be as close as possible to the actual cost in order to reduce the number of nodes being expanded. Right? And in, in practice, it's, it tends to work really well 
but it's a huge improvement over the uniform cost search. Uh, and yeah, so it's generally both of the years. worth doing. Sorry? Both of the years are better than the uniform cost. Or only A star? A star. I mean, uh, well, A, it's not guaranteed to be optimal, right? Because if you, so, that, so that you can actually do worse than uniform cost in, in that sense. Right, but, so, you know, it's, uh, uniform cost isn't bad, but it's just, you know, it depends what your computational resources are. And I gave you some examples with the eight puzzle, I think. Right, with just talking about, you know, how many states there actually are and how long it takes to search. Um, you know, you get some idea, right, that, that even for toy problems, you can easily, with an inefficient algorithm, you can easily um, get stuck where you don't get a solution in a reasonable amount of time. And by applying a, the right algorithm, suddenly these things just run in uh, a very short amount of time. Okay, so that was our um, path search. Uh, oh, one more, sorry. There's properties. Right, we talked about these properties. Completeness means, it's a good exam question, aren't they? What is completeness? Right, with respect to what we're talking about, searching the mean of the entire search space. No, not necessarily. Is it just you get the correct goal? Uh, we are guaranteed that we are going to get a solution. Yeah, you're guaranteed to get a solution if there is one. That's what we mean by completeness. Right? This is a, it's a guarantee that if there's a solution, it will find one. It may involve traversing the whole search space. Um, right? But typically, you stop when you find the goal, and you'd be really unlucky. The goal's the last <laughs> state in the search space that you're, you're searching. Optimality means that you're what? Get to the goal at the first possible way of doing it. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> Try, I mean, yeah, yeah, in some sense. Well, there's two types of optimality, isn't there? Right? Because there's one type of optimality is the, the utility of the solution that you find, right? Or the cost of the solution. So the, the solution you find has the lowest cost of all possible solutions. So that's normally what we mean. If we just say, I want an optimal algorithm, that's what we mean. But of course, there is the other type of optimality you can talk about is have we got there as quickly as we could have got there? Right, can we, is there a more efficient way of getting there? So, so when we start talking about A star and different heuristics, right, uniform cost, so even with a heuristic of always zero, uniform cost is already optimal in the sense of it finds the best solution. So what A star is giving you is a different type of optimality. It's giving you the most efficient way of getting there, given a particular heuristic. And there are ways of measuring one heuristic against another, but the ones which are higher without overestimating ever are better than ones which are lower. The ones close to zero are close to the uniform cost. The ones which are higher are closer to the actual cost. So is it um, step cost and path cost? I think we're talking about path cost here. Uh, no, uh, well, sorry, we're talking about path costs for the definition of the normal definition of optimality, and then we're talking about computational time for the yeah, other. Right, right. um, so, no, it's not the step cost and path cost goes back to brick first versus uniform cost. Right, that type of uh, optimality. Um, okay, so time and space costs. Some of these algorithms are exponential. Things which are exponential, what does that mean in practice? An algorithm with exponential memory. memory. Expensive. It's expensive. Time consuming. Time consuming. Yeah. <coughs> in practice, it means you can't solve anything apart from toy problems with it. Right? If it's exponential, then, you know, unless your problem is. Almost trivial. You're not going to be able to, to solve it. Um, so, 
Generally, anything that's exponential is, is bad. So what you want to do is really reduce algorithms to do ones which are linear in time or space, or correctly load. Right? It's useful to understand with each of these algorithms what exactly their costs are, like how many nodes are expanded. And it's always done in a kind of a very rough, worst case type of analysis, right? You take the depth from that you, your tree has, you take the depth that your first solution is at, you take the branching factor, generally you take the maximum branching factor, and you just use those values as an estimate of kind of the worst case behavior of this algorithm is such and such. And if it's exponential, then you know, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to use this in, in real life. Um, okay, so uh, you ought to be able to, to understand and, and kind of compare algorithms according to these things. I mean, yes, we've been saying depth first search uses lots of memory, depth first search doesn't, and so on. Right, if you want to be a bit more specific, you can say exactly how much it uses in terms of these estimates of depth and branching factors. Okay, any questions on path search? So that was topic three. We are a quarter of the way through the, no, well actually 30% of the way, I should say. For 12 weeks, but we're only doing 10 topics. Right. So, topic four. Uh, too many things here. Topic four. Local search. So this topic we looked at different types of search algorithms to the topic three. The topic three was all about finding a sequence of actions. And here it's about optimizing a state. So basically finding a state which the state is the solution rather than the actions. Right, so it's different types of problems. Um, sometimes they might seem similar. But uh, and there are some tasks where you don't really care how you get there. Uh, but generally, you know, local search is about problems where you don't care what steps you took to find the solution. What you want is you want to find the best way to stick these tables in the room so we can fit as many students as possible and so they can get out if there's a fire. So I have to something like that, right? You want to optimize layout, right? Or maybe it's logic gates on a semiconductor. Uh, those types of problems are uh, typical optimization problems, right? or how many flights can we get out of Heathrow per day. Right? You want to optimize, plan things in such a way that you're utilizing resources in the most um, efficient way. Right? And so you have some type of utility function or, uh, which you're trying to optimize. And um, <coughs> We talked a bit about the problems with doing these optimization problems uh, that generally the, the search spaces we're dealing with here right, are infinite and they have various undesirable properties right, that rather than being these nice smooth landscapes where you can just say I just want to go up this hill until I get to the highest point and then I'm at the, the best, I found the best utility, right, the highest value. Um, but of course, what happens is these, these spaces have a very rough landscape with lots of undulations. And so we start going uphill, and we get to the top of a hill, and we say, I found the top point. And then we look and we see another mountain. I don't know if you've been climbing mountains before, probably done that. You see this. Now, you think, oh, it's not that far, I can get to the top of that. And when you get there, you realise that just behind it was another hill, which is even higher, <laughs> and you're not at the top yet. Um, now, with all of these problems, we can't really measure, well, we kind of, we can only measure one point at a time. We can't measure the whole space. We can't generate a contour map and just look at it and say, oh, there's the highest point. There's the Mount Everest. Um, what we can do is just 
perform actions from our current state, which take us to a hopefully a state with a higher utility or a lower cost. And um, usually the searches we form will take us to these like local optima. Um, and there are various ways of describing the situations that occur with ridges where you get points where you get further. Um, only, there's only one direction you can go to preserve your, your high utility in any other direction is you're falling off um, and plateau where everything's flat. It doesn't matter which direction you go, it doesn't get any better. But foothills where you're at a local maximum. Any direction you go it takes you to a worse state. Useful though, because it means you would go up fairly quickly because you'd know you can't go up ways. So on the ridge is kind of useful because you know you can only go up. Well, not when you're on the ridge, right? I mean, it's when you're at the bottom, you're heading up the cliff or whatever, you climb up a cliff, yes, that's perfect, yeah, that's great. But then when you get to the top and you realise that, oh, if I go down the other side, um, it's, it's a lot of, I'm back to where I started. Right? Uh, yeah, the, the thing is, depending on what the strategy you're using is, it may you know, be more or less of a problem. Um, so, because the, the thing is that when you're in these situations, you can't actually know that you're in this situation. Um, I mean, you can know with the local optimum in the sense that you try all of the neighbours and there's nowhere where you can go in one step that takes you to a better state. Uh, that's the, that you can know. But with more complex situations, it's hard to, to know because the plateau, you don't know when you're on a plane. Are there any mountains? You don't know where there is one. Right? So you could just be. <laughs> maybe just the maybe the whole space is flat. Maybe it doesn't matter what you do. Everything's got the same utility. But maybe there's a better there's a direction you can go, but you can't know that from the um, you know from taking a single step. So we looked at algorithms for searching um, these type of optimization problems, the state spaces. And we started with hill climbing and looked at then various extensions of it. So hill climbing is just the greedy approach of saying, I'm in my current state, I look at what actions I can perform, I select the action which increases my utility the most. Right? And if, if there's none which increases my ut utility, then I stop. Right? Which is because I can't do any better. Right? There's no point going to a worse state, so I won't. Um, then we look at various extensions where you can um, either uh, start again, that's one approach, once you've got to a local maximum, start again, see if you can find something better, or you can try some things in parallel. I have to be looked at um, simulated annealing and local beam search as attempts to get out of this problem of the sub optimality of, of greedy search. And simulated annealing is this concept of temperature. When the temperature is high, you more, you're more likely to make moves which reduce your utility. And as the temperature reduces, so the temperature starts high and it reduces over time, as it reduces, you become less and less likely to make sub optimal moves or moves that make your uh, utility decrease and more and more likely to only take ones which increase your utility. But the hope is that by allowing these suboptimal moves at the beginning, that you get away from the bad local maxima, and you get to a better local maxima at the end. And what does that work in practice? Um, well, the, the theory says that if you decrease the temperature infinitely slowly, then you will get the optimal solution always. Uh, with, with, you know, arbitrary future, um, probability, I should say. I won't say always, I'll say it tends towards 100% <laughs> you know, probability one. Um, but in practice, I mean, people use it, so it must work for some types of problems. Um, <coughs> but, yeah, I... Because this is the... Um, well, we're doing things completely randomly over an infinite amount of time will get you... Yeah, well, exactly, that's the thing. It's choosing, I mean, that's the problem of you know, just generating random states and testing them is also guaranteed given infinite time <laughs> to give you the optimal solution. Um, 
Right, it's likely to be less efficient than, <laughs> than hill climbing or, or um, civilized annealing. Um, so we looked at local beam search, which is another approach which takes a set of states, and rather than just having a single state which we're trying to optimize, we now take a set of states, expand them all, take the k best, and do it again, right? I'm always taking the k best uh, for some number k, which is our beam width. And then finally, we looked at genetic algorithms, which are a type of beam search, is the right way to think of them, um, where we have a representation. Again, there's a data structure problem. But the first thing we need to work out is how do we represent the state. And in this case, it's a really low level decision because we're going to represent these things as bit strings. And therefore, we want to come up with very efficient ways of representing the, the, um, the states in as few bits as possible because every bit we add doubles the size of the search tracks. Right? So if we think of it that way, we realize, okay, okay, this is really important that we keep, um, come up with a clever way of representing the information. And then generally our initial population will be random and we will have uh, some selection criteria based on the fitness function, so we have a way of assessing how good each state is. So, and then selecting states which have a high fitness with a greater probability than those which have a low fitness is the typical approach. Combining them using crossover, so getting these bit strings, slicing them somewhere, and taking half of one and the other half of the other, putting them together to create a new state, and then realizing, well, that doesn't actually allow us to search the whole search space uh, in, in some cases. So we add mutation where we randomly flip one bit on some occasions, not all the time. We don't want to totally randomize our search, but we want to just add an element of randomness that allows us to get to the, kind of the, the corners of our search space that otherwise will be left uncovered. Right. So that's the idea of a genetic, genetic algorithm. And they've been used for all types of problems. Um, again, you know, none of these methods is optimal in the sense of guaranteeing you to find a solution. Right? We're talking about problems where there is no guaranteed way because we're dealing with infinite search spaces and we can't search every possible state, right? no matter what order we choose. But it's all about choosing a plausible order that increases the probability of finding a good solution in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so any questions on topic four? Okay. Let's go to topic five then. So this one you know all about, right? We've been working on it. Adversarial search. This one is quite a limited topic in, in that there's basically one solution that works really well. The minimax algorithm guarantees that you will find a, uh, an optimal solution under the assumption that your opponent is also playing optimally. But if your opponent doesn't play optimally, it's still does at least as well. Right, it may even do better than what it thought. Um, okay, so I guess you know what the minimax algorithm is. I don't need to explain that. I'll the pruning. I guess you know what that is. Or do I need to? I mean, if you want me to go over it, some of you have succeeded in coding it, and so you're very happy. If you like, we don't need to cover this. Depth limited search, what's that about? Well, in real life, you can only look four moves ahead, right? <laughs> seven. Or seven. Seven if you're in the star coder, right? <laughs> so, so those who with supernatural powers can get up to seven, but the rest of us can, can only look four moves ahead. And um, so 
what we need to do is some type of heuristic evaluation. Um, my heuristic basically also includes the terminal state you know, because I didn't see the point in doing two tests. Yep. Is, is that a fundamentally wrong approach or? No, I guess not. I mean, so what, you, but then when it returns the value you. When it returns the winning state, it will not ever be overwritten. Yeah. No, of course not. It's fine. Um, no, wait a second. You can check. But you check for you need to check for a terminal state when you're not at the yes, maximum so you need, depth. You need to check. So you need to check it anyway. Yeah. So you're calculating your heuristic when you don't need to. For the other because cases. you're reading the, you have to read the board anyway okay. <laughs> to I mean, get yeah. to know if you've got five in a row. You might as well check to see what else you've got. Whether you've got four in a row, yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, that makes sense. So heuristic functions are like we're discussing, right? Yeah, well, not the five in a row because that's really a terminal test, but, but in a sense, I mean, since the heuristic has to agree with the utility, right, then it does need to give you the maximum positive score if you're if got your five in a row for the uh, max player, and of course the minimum possible score if it's the five in a row for the, the min player. Um, so tell me, heuristic evaluation functions, how do you do this? How does one come up with a good one? Score a position. Sorry? Score a position. Yes, so how do you score a position? Based on how good it is for the player. When you can move. Yeah, okay, so we're playing a game. Of so like a noughts and crosses, having two in a row would give you a good score. Sorry? The noughts and crosses, having two in a row would give the player a good score. Yeah. And having Two twos in a row would give me a better score. Maybe. You think it would guarantee a win? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to be. If you had two twos in a row. Two twos in a row like this, right? <laughs> Does that guarantee a win? Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. You have to be careful. Two twos in a row. You think it guarantees a win, then you realise, ah, oh, I have to actually check whether the two twos in a row actually meet at the same square, because if they do. <laughs> It can still be blocked, <laughs> blocked two, two at the same time. So, is it just how well close you are to winning? Well, yes, it's exactly that. It's that heuristic that guesses how close am I to winning, or am I, am I winning at all? Right. So, if I'm max, then I'm. If my score is positive, then I'm saying that I think I'm winning. If my score is negative, I'm saying I'm losing. Uh, that's right. But how do you measure it? Whether you've got two in a row, right? And in tic tac toe, that's. It's better than one. <laughs> it's better than one, right? So, so, yes, you can look at the board, go through all of the winning combinations, and look do I have two in a row, or three in a row, or four in a row? What do I mean by in a row? Horizontal, vertical, and diagonal. Yeah, some people get this very wrong though. Three in a row, there's two types of three in a row, two things you could mean by it, right? That could mean you might have got three next to each other, three adjacent ones, which are all in the same line. Or it could mean that I've got three out of five, right? which may have spaces between them, which may also be a valuable thing to have, but it's not three in a row, right? You may only have one in a row. Right? You may have one, then a space, then one, then a space, then one. You're still closer to winning than if you didn't have them all in the same row. But of course, if you have one and a space, and, one, and then there's a, one of the other colour, and one, then how much are they worth? Zilch, right. So, right, so your evaluation function is to take these things into consideration, right? What's, what is of value, what's not? Right? It's not just giving points for how many things you have on the board, but are they in a, a situation? Right? You could have four in a row, and it could be zero value because it's on some diagonal where you've got two inches here and here, and it doesn't get any longer than four. Right? 
zero value, right? It doesn't, that by itself doesn't win you anything. So you have to look at the situation to make sure that you're calculating meaningful values. Uh, but how do you turn four in a row or three in a row or two in a row into a number? Well, you can, at trading time, when you can switch off the time limit, for example, and then you can go all the way to the end of the tree and then try to come up with something that gives you the optimum. Has anyone tried that? For <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I have time, I'm going to try it to one of different scoring systems, but I don't know if I'm going to have time to do that as well. Okay. And you can also sort of kind of... You have an idea how to kind of look at the probabilities, like if you've got, like you could give four in a row, double the score of three in a row or something like that. Mm -hmm. I tried to make it so two three in a rows wouldn't be to four in a row. Or okay. as many three in a rows as possible would not beat a winning move or anything like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there are various situations and of course there's different types of four in a row. Right? Because if one end is blocked, <laughs> then <laughs> it's not so valuable with the other player's turn. Uh, but if neither end is blocked, then you don't care if the other person's turn, let them have a turn. Right? So many things to consider right, in, in calculating your, your evaluation function. But yes, you need to work out the relative weights and the difference between having lots of three in a row or lots of two in a row compared to having a four in a row and so on. That's what it's about. And I think the idea of trying out many solutions and playing them against each other, I mean, that's... Time permitting. Yeah, time, well, there's only two games to play, right? <laughs> if you've got a pair of, <coughs> pair of options, right? You've got two options here, then you have to play, because it's deterministic. Right? They don't actually give you a lot of information, but you can just see which one works better and try lots of values. Or you can put them all against each other in a big matrix if you want, but it's maybe more, it's maybe slower. You can just do a, a well, why don't you write a genetic algorithm to try, to, to, your state space is all the possible I'm values just, you can give three in a row and four in a row, right? I'm actually going to ask, is, <laughs> if we threw away many makes and can yeah. we use something like genetic algorithm? I'm not going to attempt this, of course, <laughs> but, but would it be possible just to say, this is my board, go nuts. Choose uh, the best, most fit survivors until we get one hurt. No, because it's not, it's a different, it's a sequence problem, right? It's not a, it's not a, a state problem, so that's the wrong type of problem, I think, for this. Um, yeah, but, I mean, I think more of the question is somebody asked me at the beginning of the, when I first gave out the assignment, somebody said, can we do it with a deep network? And I said, <laughs> if you've got a lot of time. But I, I think realistically, I'd be very surprised if anyone's got a solution with uh, a deep network, just because it's the, the training time and the, I mean, yes, it's nice, it's a nice conceptual thing, but it'll probably take you quite a few months to get it to work and actually produce something useful. So a nice screen that's on the time. Do you have a bit of time? Game for chance. How do you deal with chance? Introduce an extra... An extra level in the tree which represents the probability of all the different outcomes. And instead of just taking the maximum or the minimum of the children, you take the weighted sum, weighted by the probabilities. And that gives us not a... Whatever the child is, times. Yeah, so probability times the, the, the value for each of the ones, and that's because it's a weighted sum and the weights all add up to one, and it still gives you something that's within the same range, that's the same meaning as the, as the utility function values. Um, that gives you then not the optimal solution, but the it optimizes the expected value, right, which is the so best you can do. Over a couple of hundred games. Yeah. will give you what is most likely to yeah, it will give you be beneficial to you. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit hard to say. In, in, yeah, but, but basically, yes, over, over many games, it will eventually uh, you know, 
gives you, you know, gives you the kind of the optimal plane. Now, of course, there may be other factors that, you know, maybe not all games are equal. Maybe people get different amounts in each game. And therefore, that, but you know, you have to include that in the calculation as well. Okay, so that was topic five. Very briefly, we started on decision trees. And we looked at, firstly, the whole thing of what it is to perform classification, our classes, the classes, a class is just another feature, in a sense, but it's a feature that you don't know the value of right? when, you're, when you're performing classification, right? you're trying to find out the value of a particular variable, which you call the class label. Um, they're, of course, discrete. Right? You have a finite set, usually a small set of possible values, possible classes, and you use all the other features that you can measure in order to predict and work out what the, um, the class is, is most likely to be. And we looked at different types of features. There are um, symbolic and numeric. Right, just so we have continuous and discrete uh, values. And we looked at uh, feature selection. How do you choose the right features or the best features? And that took us into the world of information theory, in which we defined entropy, a measure of Either randomness or information, depending on how you think about it. Right? It's a measure of randomness, meaning the amount of information you would need to know in order to predict the class of the um, object or the way of thinking about for classification. And for classification, the important concept is not just the amount of information uh, that a feature gives you but whether that information is relevant. So whether that information is shared, so mutual information is shared information with the class label. And so that's what um, the ID3 algorithm, which is the one we're looking at in this topic, um, that's what it does. It chooses features based on their, um, how well they share information with the class label. So how well does knowing the value of a particular feature, how much does that tell us about the, which class the object belongs to? Right, and then we want to basically query the, the features which tell us the most about the, um, the, the class label. Right, and then the, the way we do that in ID3 is by building a decision tree Right, where each node in the tree, if it's an internal node, then it's a question. Each of the branches to its children, uh, the various possible answers to the question. And so they divide the solution space, the state space, into these various subsets. And then the leaf nodes in the tree are the class labels. So when you and we ask these questions and follow the, the link belonging to the uh, respective answers, the question, answer, question, answer, and so on, you follow, go down the tree. When you get to, the, to a, um, a leaf node, there are a point where you know that this object must belong to this one particular class. Right, that's the idea. And so what we're doing in ID3 is we're using this principle of information gain which is the amount of reduction in the information needed in order to classify the object. So you choose the features which have the highest mutual information, and therefore, once you've asked it, the amount of further information you need is, is the lowest possible. Right? And that's the idea of information gain. Right? And we have this ID3 algorithm, which we'll talk about again next week. Uh, in our lecture, and we'll continue on and look at an example of, of how to do uh, the 
can apply it to a real world problem. Okay, so that's a summary of what we've done so far. We're about halfway through. A bit more than halfway through, 60%. Yeah. So, um, good luck with your last few days and your assignments. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll get your results through by next week because there'll be one or two people always who hand your assignments in late and have to rerun it for them. So I might have some preliminary results next Tuesday. searching all of the possible moves you can make, I mean, why then why don't you just use your... You've already got Minimax search with alpha beta to do that and search all the possible moves. So it's not supposed to be doing that. It's supposed to be looking at the board and looking at how many three arrows, that type of thing, and scoring them somehow. And how many is the opponent? How many is the Take the difference. He gets the number, he tells you who's going but it's. You want it to be reasonably efficient because that's the bottom of the tree, so there's many, many times that's going to be calculated. Right? It's going to be 64 times as many. You're going to multiply by the 16 pi. I'm going to do 16 pi because it's just clear. I'm not ready for that. I'm not like when I play say on on my phone and stuff, that feels quite a bit yeah, right. uh, easier. So how many moves you would that be? Going back to lab. Yeah. Okay. Do you think five, six moves ahead are pretty much? Yeah, but you don't think that's why the other moves ahead. Every single possible move. That's the thing. It's like, you know, a good chess player thinks five or six moves ahead, but they're only thinking of about five possible moves they can make because they intuitively know that Lots of moves are just not worth considering. Yeah. Now, of course, every now and then, one of them is worth considering, and then some computer comes up with a, a move that nobody would have thought of because, because of this. So humans, uh, we have a way of kind of reducing the, the, the possible moves that we're going to do to a, a, a small subset of yeah. And we explore those. We explore those, those, right? Uh, we can't do that with a computer. If you try to do that with a computer, you would just come up with a very, very poor algorithm. Um, so we have to do this brute force and yeah. try everything. Um, so yeah, how many moves do you have to think ahead? I don't know. I mean, we, we asked, and then people said that everyone can look about four moves ahead, and then you know, except for one, right? one person can look seven moves ahead. Um, that's I think four moves ahead is, is about right. You know, that, that's you know, that plays well. Yeah. I, um, I mean, if I remember correctly, I can still beat mine playing against mine, but. The, Part of that is that once you work out the winning sequence, you just yeah. can do the same thing every time because it's deterministic. Right? So you kind of, if you find a, a, a way to get around it. And, but it's, I mean, to get a really good player, you have to consider forcing moves. You have to consider sequences of forcing moves. And, um, and that can be, that's a bit complex to do, but it's, um, it makes a big difference because. The, like 
human players, good, very good human players, that's how they're thinking. And they will look many moves ahead. Like once, once you're forcing sequence that you know you can place a piece and you know the other player has to play here because otherwise they've lost. And then you place this piece and you know the other player has to play here to block that. And you play here and then